a tremendous performance. Bobby Allison, the leader of the Alabama gang. I got to give a tremendous amount of credit to Bud Moore. Car did run perfectly all day. Pearson gives his car a breathtaking ride down the front stretch and into first place. Running like a thief in the back stretch, it's Jarrett, number 11, making a move. Lee Petty, in number 42, still running wide open. Lee Petty takes command of the race. NASCAR was a sport started by survivors. They were the greatest generation. Men like Walter Bud Moore, who fought for freedom. The course of a fledgling sport was charted by these men who changed the course of history. For Walter Bud Moore, the road to NASCAR began with the road to Berlin. His is a tale of uncommon valor and every man heroism. The scars of battle serve as a blueprint for Bud Moore's racing life. When the war was over, I said I'd never go back because I just didn't want to go back. I had some good friends that uh, I've had a couple of, you know, that was in my squad that got killed right beside me. Hey, machine gun. Let's have some lunch. He hollered, hey, machine gunner. I said, yeah, come on, let's have lunch. Where are you from? Georgia, the hills. You? South Carolina. You get to ride home much? When I can. I sit over in the foxhole with him. We ate that K-Russian. You got a best girl? Yep. Yeah, me too. Her name's Jean. What about yours? Betty. You married? No. Uh, <laughs> she wanted to, but I didn't think it was right. You know, what if I don't come back and all? Hey, you play ball? No. Not even stick ball? No. I race cars. Things is getting hot. I'm going to get back. OK. We started getting a few rounds of artillery coming in. I said, I better get back over there. And I said, things going to get hot here in a minute. Hey, you be careful, Georgia. Hey, machine gun, you be careful racing them cars. Don't go too crazy behind the wheel now. I'm going to bring my boy to you. I just got out artillery shell in his hole. Never did see him no more. He was gone. Not one particle. So you don't never know. Ain't nothing we can do about it now. He was just here. Come on, we gotta keep moving forward.
These are the men, the men who build the car and plan the race, the mechanics. And here's Ralph Moody, chief mechanic for Fred Lorenzen, Smokey Eunuch, and Bud Moore, guys who've made their names as racing mechanics on tracks across the country. He was smart enough and wily enough to know that he was not a good driver. But he sure knew how to make things work, how to put parts together and make them fly. He was gifted with this incredible gift of, of just being a natural engineer. He would look at things and figure out how we can make them better and how come this isn't working the way it should. What did you do to that thing? Made the accelerator an inch longer? It lets the cartridge out easier. Did it to all the 30 caliber guns in D Company. That's why ours never jam. You're always tinkering with something, ain't you? Yep. <laughs> Hopefully for the better. Bud Moore possessed a mechanical mind. When the war ended, he headed to motorsports, becoming a crew chief and mechanic for an upstart race league, NASCAR. Bud Moore was very special. Those cars were like music instruments because if you detune one thing, you change that spring or you change that shock, you change everything. And to know in your head, with all those parts and pieces floating around, that, that's an art. And he is one of the masters of the art. Mechanic Bud Moore stops the watch on the fastest official lap in Darlington's 14-year history, 134 miles an hour. The run breaks all qualification records. It's apparently going to gamble. Bud, you're gambling now? We're gambling. We're trying to stretch our gas stops real bad. How many miles do you expect him to get out of this last tank full? I hope he gets 90 miles or 91 miles. If we do, we'll make it. We run second in quite a few of them and uh, run third. We ran good, but just never could get that win. Bud came to um, Darlington in 1957 working for Speedy Thompson, and they had a 57 Chevy. And uh, Darlington was the ultimate race. They had the big beauty pageant. They had the big parade. They would bring in the biggest TV stars at the time. He always stood out in the crowd because he was kind of, at the time, he was a little bit of a string bean. You know, he was tall, and then he had this plaid colored, almost like a pea cap on Bud Moore, Thompson's mechanic, watches as Thompson pounds out the mile. The white flag. Speedy Thompson begins his last lap. The longest lap in the race for his mechanic and pit crew. The checkered flag. Lee Thompson in number 46 Chevrolet sets a new record in winning the Southern 500. It really helped put Bud on the, on the map. I mean, that 1957 season for him was amazing. Between winning the championship, speedy winning at Darlington, it was just a, a kind of a watershed year for Bud. In 1961, Bud became a race team owner. He built his new team by building up the men around him. He's a decorated veteran. You've got to believe that that teaches you things about people and how to treat people and how to have, more so than anything, camaraderie. He always came across as one of his guys. If you, if you, you didn't know Bud Moore and you walked in that garage area, you would have no idea that Bud Moore was the owner of that car because he was there, he was in uniform like his guys, he was working with his guys. Bud Moore, today he has number eight, a Pontiac. Driver, Joe Weatherly. Weatherly, you know, he was always, everybody called him the clown prince of race NASCAR, you know. He's always pulling jokes on different ones and all this kind of stuff.
clown prince of racing is Pontiac's Joe Weatherly. What are your victory chances, Joe? Uh, I think I'll have a pretty good chance. I've been running real good out there during practice and all. Him and Turner, you know, they'd go out the night before and party and do all this stuff and everything. And many times, you know, come time to race and Wedley come out there and said, boy, I'll tell you, my head busting wide open. So we always kept a great big bottle of buffering in the, in the toolbox. Uh, he didn't just take one, he'd take six of them. And he drank him a big bottle of water behind them, you know, and all this stuff. And he'd go over there and he called for Turner Pops. He'd say, hey, Pops. He said, I got the cure right here. <laughs> he'd go give Turner some of them buffers too, you know. <laughs> and they'd get in that race car by then, you know, and get in there and they'd just run the daylights out of it. Joe Weatherly, he's won more races than you can count. They won 18 races together. So Bud Moore was breaking ground. He and Joe Weatherly were, and they were going to the tracks, and they were the people to beat. 40 of the toughest drivers, smartest mechanics, and fastest equipment in the racing business. Some drivers, like Joe Weatherly, can tell his mechanic, Bud Moore, what he wants. One thing that Bud Moore always likes about someone is their tenacity. There's Joe Weatherly coming into the pits after his crash with David Pearson. Mr. Katamaki, are you near the situation down there? Yes, we are, and it's a sledgehammer being swung heavily here by Chief Mechanic Bud Moore. Joe is waiting. We'll see what Joe has to say. You're not hurt, are you? I'm not hurt, but uh, I want to put that, that day person in the hospital. His brain's hurt. I see. Well, there's Joe Weatherly's comments from uh, right from the cockpit, and he's a mad man. 1962, wow. Bud Moore and Joe Weatherly end up winning the championship keep that consistency going in 1963 and what do you know they won a second championship you know two in a row that had only been done once before I really enjoyed working with him and uh, I know he did with me and uh, we got along exceptionally well NASCAR champion Joe Weatherly talks it over with Bud Moore his mechanic we all were one big family and my wife would fix lunch you know for everybody even before the war Betty Clark was Bud's girl. In times of strife, the pen can be mightier than the sword. Writing to Betty, his future wife, kept Bud going through hard times. We were married uh, December the 1st, 1945, and I lost her September the 17th, 09. We was married 64 years, and that was a long time, you know, and uh, enjoyed every minute of it. NASCAR was a dangerous sport. Peril lurked around every turn. But Moore was well versed in life threatening situations. As a 19 year old, he stormed the beaches of Normandy. I was scared to death, and I, the only thing that could come in my mind, I said, these people have gone crazy. They are plumb, they're killing one another. I can't believe this, you know? And, you know, you just didn't expect it. The landing craft came in. He supposed it went in enough to, that when he let it down, it, we would only be in water about knee deep. When our boat came in, he didn't get all the way in where he should have been. He let us off too far out, and I was in water up to my neck. But I stepped in a shell hole and got under, went under. Finally got out of that shell hole and got moving a little bit. They'd already told us to get off of that thing, get off the beach. No, it, you can't shoot nobody, you can't do nothing. Just get, get across the beach. So that's what I did. I just went straight as I could go and didn't worry about getting shot or nothing. I just went straight across the beach and got over behind a sand dune. <laughs> And I still couldn't breathe. I had water all down in me, done about drowned, 
choking and everything else. In 1964, Bud would face tragedy again. This time not on a beach in Normandy, but on a racetrack in Riverside, California, with his champion, Joe Weatherly. Early in the race, they had transmission problems. So Joe came in off the track. They did some work on the, uh, on the transmissions, got him back on the track, and then going into one of the, uh, the hard right-hand turns, uh, there was a problem with the brakes. He went into turn five, running about 100, 105, and uh, hit the brake pedal, and they didn't have no brakes. And it sent him into the wall. And it was just an in instantaneous thing. Boom, right into the wall, and Joe was gone. It was a bad deal all the way around, and uh, we lost a heck of a good race driver. We got back home. I told my wife, I said, I think I'm going to, I I think I'm ready to quit. I ain't going to put up with this. What kept Bud Moore going? Was it because of what he had endured as a young man in the military that he knew how fragile life was? The fragility of life became even more evident in 1965 with the death of Bud's new driver, Billy Wade. When Billy had his accident at Daytona, he had the lap belt. Well, the lap belt moved up, and when it moved up, it had a, a devastating effect on his internal organs. So that's when I took another part of a shoulder harness that's got the same hook up on it, and we hooked it underneath the seat and plugged it in, and then they stood back there and jerked on it, and then the only thing I could feel was the shoulder harness pulling back on my shoulder, but that seat belt stayed right there, and it was tight. The next race we went to, Norris Friel came over there and said, what kind of seat belt is this jockey strap you're talking about? He was the NASCAR inspector. He says, that looks pretty good, so he said, let me get in there. So I got out of the car, and he crawled in there. He hooked it up, and he's seen what it does, and he said, that's, that's something. Now, that's, that's really something. Bud's innovations in stock car racing became NASCAR standards. His innovations on the battlefield became new, life-saving techniques. A lot of guys killed and all this stuff by air burst. So what I did, I dug the hole about two foot deep. Then I dug back underneath the bottom of it about a foot over where I could roll my body up underneath and have that much dirt on top of it. I've been in that hole and they start throwing them shells in there and I just, they just tear my hole up with hardwood shrapnel. So these are the things you had to do to protect yourself as much as possible. The grinding, lightning allied smash that carried across France and breached the Siegfried Line. And the man who led it, General Patton, master of blitz. I guess I was very fortunate, you know, being in the third army with, with General Patton. Once he got the Germans backing up, he didn't believe in stopping. They'd give us a projected to do, you know, so I was gonna take this town over here and it's up there about a mile, half, two miles. And we'd take that town, and that didn't stop Patton. We kept going. Once we got them Germans backing up and get them disorganized, we'd hit them that much harder. And they always said, you know, so well, Patton, you tell him to go a mile, and said, he'll go 30, and that's what we did. Patton got on the courthouse steps in this little old town, had him a megaphone, and he'd stand there, had that little old white dog and them ivory handle pistols on and all, and he started briefing us. 
He said, now, boys, I tell you what, says, I know y'all ain't had a hot meal or anything on this part. He, but he said, we got another problem. It's real bad, and it's 90 miles away. And said, we've got to go do something about it. He says, Romeo's got, got the 101st, and then I got them surrounded up there in Bastogne and kicking the hell out of them. He said, we've got to go up there and get them out. And he said, I'll tell you now, he says, we're going to leave here in 45 minutes. We're going to kill every SOB on the way. And he meant it, too. There's a lot of similarities between Patton and the way he handled his people and Bud and the way he handled his people. Uh, you know, Patton was really a role model for Bud Moore. Bud Moore's been building race cars for about 25 years and running him through tech inspection for just about as long. He owns car number 15, and Buddy Baker drives it. The one thing you can say about Bud Moore, he was the boss at the shop, the boss at the racetrack, but he always had that car as good as you could have it. And when I drove for him, it was an honor. By 1975, it was nine years since Bud Moore won a cup race. He was determined to end the drought. And he was determined to do it his way. He dynoed his own motors. And the first thing, when they'd get up to about 3,000 RPM on the dyno motor, whoo, and when he got to 5,000, his heel would start up off the floor. When he got to about 8,000, he looked like a, a, you know, a dancer up on their toes. And I'd go, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> In Bud's shop, a racing engine is put together like a watch. It not only has to produce speed, but it's got to be strong to last for 500 miles at speeds of up to 200 miles an hour. It gets pushed to the limits. And if it wins or loses, it's inspected and detailed records are kept. Without this kind of precision and care, you can't win on the Grand National Circuit. We went to Talladega. It was almost like, okay, we're gonna win. He knew that with Buddy, he had someone that wasn't afraid to run the high speeds at Talladega. And he also knew that if he was gonna put that car in victory lane that day, he had to be that potent number 43. In the 1970s, the Petties ruled over racing. Four championships in five years. If Bud Moore was gonna get back into victory lane, he had to take the petties head on. The showdown happened in 1975 at Talladega Super Speedway. Biggest thing, you know, like Talladega was, and, and I ran a car a little bit different than a lot of people. I went to the racetrack with the race set up on my car. When we qualified at Talladega, we'd qualify 18th, 19th, and 20th. I didn't care where we qualified. I went down there to win the race. Just like I told Baker, he got on me, you know, and said, you know, said, this business qualifying back where I'm at, 18th, 19th, 20th, he said, now that ain't right. You need to start working on less qualifying. I said, Baker, just remember one thing. They don't say one word about who qualified where on Monday morning. Now all they talk about who won the race. I qualified my I think, 25th. And seven laps, I was leading the race. You're watching number 15, Buddy Baker, scream into the lead. Buddy Baker's court, Richard Petty's Dodge, will decide the $165,000 showdown in a Talladega weekend. The white flag, 60 official lead changes among 17 drivers. Richard Petty seeking to make it 61. Well, I knew he was coming hard, but I knew that uh, he had his work cut out if he's gonna get by Baker. Half a lap to go. Baker still deployed in first, the persistent Petty second, then Petty starts to reel Baker in. At turn four, Petty sets up the slingshot by Baker for the finish. But Baker refuses to be intimidated by the master, forces Petty out of the throttle. Buddy Baker, the winner. Owner and crew chief Bud Moore tips his hat to a champion. Bud Moore, he was my hero. 
for what he did in the Army, but he's also my hero in everyday life, too. He learned early on that you do not give up. We picked it up in the service because you had no alternatives there. You had to keep going. Baker got out of my car in 1977. When I left Bud, he said something that probably haunts any driver. He said, you're going to regret leaving. And I hired Bobby Allison. Bud was somebody that I admired from early on. And his equipment was good enough that he was often in contention. See, I had run one, several Grand National races, but not Daytona. Live from the Daytona International Speedway in Daytona Beach, Florida, ABC Sports presents the 20th annual Daytona 500, the world's richest and most prestigious stock car race. And the car was pretty good at Daytona, and so I was happy with that. And then in the qualifying race, I got wrecked right at the end of the race. It tore the car really bad. I said, boys, we got to fix this car. He had had that team of his well and away, night and day, for three days to get that car back on the track. So Bobby comes out to the racetrack about 11 o'clock Saturday morning. I decided I'd walk down and tell Bud Moore that I was going home. <laughs> and what got him, you know, just as we were making an approach up to where the car was, he saw it sitting there. He said, where'd that car come from? I said, what do you mean? I said, that's the car we're going to race. And those guys had straightened that car out, painted it, fresh engine, redone the chassis. I mean, had done an amazing repair job to that car. And I said, these guys have worked this hard for me. I need to stay here one more day. We'll return live again to Daytona International Speedway. In second place in the race at the moment is the veteran 41-year-old Bobby Allison of Hueytown, Alabama, in car number 15. He is several hundred yards behind Buddy Baker at this point. Buddy Baker must now begin to have dreams of winning the Daytona 500, the career object of every member of NASCAR. I had a full lap on everybody. Well, he's always a very competitive man. He wasn't at all pleased with his last year, of course. He even changed teams. He got away from the team he had been driving for. But Moore, very successful team, which he left, I think felt a little bit hurt by this. Three laps to go, the engine blows up. Ah, oh, what a bad bit of luck. Buddy Baker's engine has blown right in the front stretch here. A lot of smoke coming out of the car there. Buddy as Baker. Has, as has happened to Buddy so many times in the past. I'm coasting down pit road, and guess what? The 15 with Bobby Allison goes by. When's the Daytona 500? The checkered flag will be coming out for Allison before a crowd of more than 100,000 people, and that's it. It's all over. And I could almost hear Bud in my ear going, you're going to regret this. <laughs> After an exhausting, traumatic day of motor racing here at Daytona, Bobby Allison has won the Daytona 500. The car did run perfectly all day. I got to give a, just a tremendous amount of credit to Bud Moore and all the crew. I wrecked the car on Thursday, as you know, and uh, they've rebuilt it. And uh, we suffered through a lot of problems today, and they just kept right on going, and here we are. old, Bud Moore was an old soul. To many in the platoon, he was the voice of reason. Nearly 40 years later, Moore was still mentoring. The one in need of guidance? A young Dale Earnhardt. Dale Earnhardt came out of the box just smoking. Until 1979, won Rookie of the Year. And then in 1980, he goes out and he wins a championship. No one had ever done that before. To win the rookie title one year, the championship the next year. That was unheard of for all the amazing success that he had in those first two seasons. He didn't win a race in 81. The opportunity came along to drive for Bud. 
it is Dale Earnhardt in car number 15 who is the leader at the moment, the Grand National Champion in 1980, who had a dry 1981. Earnhardt really had his work cut out for him because uh, he was going head-to-head -head with Cal Yarborough, the master. Darlington was his home track. You know, Cal Yarborough first raced there as a teenager, so he knew the track like the back of his hand. And uh, then here comes Earnhardt. He really didn't have that much experience. It was interesting to see the two generations going head-to-head -head there. I think probably Dale Earnhardt looked up to Bud Moore almost as, as a little bit of a, of a father figure. And I think Bud Moore had that knack for getting someone like Dale under control. Dale Earnhardt would drive through the grandstands if he thought he could pass a car. And I think what Bud Moore did, because of his experience, because when he spoke, people even like Dale Earnhardt listened, is he was able to corral that talent and make Dale realize we can't win races. We can't win a championship if we're scratching our head trying to figure out how we're gonna get this mangled mess in the trailer. Let's check in now in Dale Earnhardt's pit with Sam Posey. Sam? Al, I'm with Bud Moore, the chief of the Dale Earnhardt car. Bud, your car has led more laps than any other car in the season thus far, but you've often had trouble right at this point, very deep in the race. How does it look this time? Well, everything's looking right good right now. We hope everything will hold up. Dale Yarborough has just moved into first place in the Rebel 500. Yarborough is on top with Dale Earnhardt in second place, 12 laps to go. And they are right now wheel to wheel. And look at this, they're going round this one track race, it's side by side. But I have to say that Dale Earnhardt passed more convincingly. There's Yarbrough getting much closer, and this is the type of place where he can come off of this turn now. Kale, I mean, he's he's got his reputation to protect. You know, this is his track. He doesn't want to get beat at his own track by this kid. And yet Kale is still right there. However, unable to pick up any ground. It is Earnhardt cruising along as they'll come out of turn number four. One last gasp now for Kale Yarborough as he tries to go to the inside, but he cannot get him. Dirt and dust is flying. Kale, he tried everything he could, and he just couldn't get past Earnhardt. Dale Earnhardt on his way to a victory in the Rebel 500. Saluting the crowd as they salute him. But Moore puts Dale Earnhardt back in victory lane. Well, Dale, you had to work right up to quitting time, didn't you, to win this one? Well, it's tough. And you know, I've been saying all along, if we can run up to the end, maybe we have a shot at winning the race. And, you know, his forward's been running good all day. And Bud Moore really did put a, hard, a lot of hard work into it. You just don't know what war is, honey. When they say it's hell, it's worse than hell. <laughs> I'll tell you. We get hit with shrapnel, you know, and I've had places on me, you know, that was pretty bad. I said, well, at least I'll be off the front lines a day or a couple of days. But they they do all that, and when they did, they send your butt right back. So you didn't get to stay back. Bud Moore was wounded five times, each time returning to the front lines. He earned five Purple Hearts. He later earned the admiration of his young drivers. Here's Bud, you know, here's a guy that, you know, 18 years old, about the same age I was when I started racing. He's on the beaches in Normandy, you know, carrying a 50 caliber machine gun and everybody's shooting at him. Uh, you know, none of, none of these guys in this whole garage are, can even compare to that toughness. It was pretty intimidating to go down there and talk to Bud Moore and say, hey, uh, Bud, I'd like to drive your race car. Uh, Rudd was a heck of a little race driver, and uh, we went to Daytona with Rudd in 1984. Ricky Rudd's car seems to be running awfully strong. He's, we've seen him make several moves there. It is a magnificent chess game that is being played here. Oh, trouble. trouble. Ricky Rudd slamming toward the wall. The reporter 
for Ricky Rudd's home paper jumped and ran out of the media center. He explained to me that with Bud Moore having lost Joe Weatherly and of course Billy Wade, his first thought was, oh no, here we go again for Bud. And I was, I was scared to death. I thought maybe it's going to be hurt real bad. You're watching live from the Daytona International Speedway, the Bush Clash of 84, the most serious crash in the six-year history of this event, the Bud Moore car destroyed. Ricky came out of there with some severe injuries. When a race car is flipping and doing all those gyrations, the, the blood in the body wants to go to the weakest part to try to, to get out of the body. And it, with Ricky, it went to his eyes. I remember being in the hospital that, that afternoon on into early evening, and I remember telling my wife, I'm getting out of this hospital, I'm going. You know, I had hoses, lines hooked up, said, I'm leaving, I'm getting out of here. She said, no, you're not. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've got to go. i got to get out of here. I'm, I'm going to be at the track tomorrow morning. And then you know, she proceeded to tell me how crazy I was. And then she said, well, you really feel that adamant about it? She said, uh, there's a mirror on the wall over there. Why don't you go and get up? Walk, ease over to that mirror and look at yourself. And when I got over to the mirror, I remember looking. I, you know, I didn't know who the, the face looking back. I didn't recognize it. His whole face was all bruised up, and his eyes, uh, his, his eyelids, and uh, his top of his eyebrows up here. This was all swollen up. And I remember doing a, like a three-lap run and cutting it clean, and, and coming in telling him, man, I, I can't see. And he said, what do you mean you can't see it? His eyes was all swollen, and I figured, you know, I took my hand and pushed his eyebrows back and I could see that's what was wrong. He looked at my face and was swollen up pretty good. He says, uh, duct tape. I took some tape and pulled them back like this and uh, taped them over. I think Ricky was all for doing this. He just needed that reassurance from that father figure. Bud Moore was kind of that to Ricky Rudd and it was an unbelievable feat. It was just seven days ago that Ricky Rudd took that series of sidewinders out of turn four. Since then, he has returned to the track, he has qualified, and his car rests now 14th on the grid. And then probably even makes it what more unbelievable is one week later, they go to Richmond, Virginia, and they win the race. That made me feel so doggone good to know that Ben beat up like he was, then go on to Richmond and win the race. With the action he went through, I mean, uh, he was something. To me, Bud's an American hero, and uh, to have the chance to have worked uh, alongside of somebody like that uh, in racing, um, it definitely, you, you learned a, a whole lot about character, I can tell you that. It was an honor to be able to say I worked alongside with Bud Moore. We had to patrol the streets. Me and the Jeep driver got up the top of the hill, and there's a house sort of. We had to go by it, and there's two German soldiers. Is the mother good? No, I go back home. I have a hunger and thirst. There, two of them. Find the infantry. Find the infantry. Had an air cool machine gun on the dash of that Jeep, so I fired at them two soldiers. One of them kept running. He's running all across the hill and the other, and he's standing there with his hand up. See, come out, yeah? You're coming out, yeah? You're coming out. You're coming out. You speak German, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Tell him to drop his belt. Lassen Sie Ihr Gürtel. Tell Fickton. Auf den Game. What are you doing? I'm, I'm gonna shoot him. Nah, don't do that. He ain't right. He gave up and all this, and uh, I didn't think, you know, the Jeep driver said, what are we gonna do with him? I said, we're gonna take him with us. We'll put him on the hood. Let's take him with us.
we supposed to make a right turn. Well, we didn't make it, we kept going straight. And when we did, there's a concrete block like house sitting up down there. And, and they started shooting us in the Jeep. You tell him to go and tell them Germans to come out right now. We're gonna go get the artillery and blow them straight to hell. Position! Position! We come out! If you dodge! Let's get out of here, bud. We don't have no artillery. I know that. Just relax. But be ready. Here they come out, and I couldn't believe what was coming out of there. We'd, caught, caught, we'd captured a German headquarters. There's five German officers, and I think there was about, I don't know, 18 or 20 soldiers. For capturing the German headquarters, Bud Moore was awarded the Bronze Star of Valor, one of two he received during the war. Now, what are we going to do with all them? That's a good question, Lieutenant. <laughs> good job. Bud Moore had done his time. When World War II ended, Bud never looked back. His racing dreams became a way of life. 50 years in NASCAR. 68 cup wins, three championships, and today, he is at peace. A soldier who proudly served. for her fanfare and victory, for her ideals well-preserved, for her millions whose affection comes from knowing they owe their lives. America adores her heroes. To soar, to serve, to blaze a trail never before tread upon. This is heroic. This is the fabric of our country principles woven together to represent our people. People gathered together to represent in our nation. Our best, our bravest, our most resolute, An innovator who became a champion. A leader who became a legend. Walter Bud Moore. Our American hero. <laughs>